So, Mr. Clever George Urschel. Was his name George? No. Charles. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Yeah, it's Crew Trime, see? If you're new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day. Also put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like a fun combination to you, you're in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. What are we thinking about the color of this shirt? It's gross, right? I ran a 5K and this was the shirt. This is the color of the shirt from the from the run. Who chose this? Gross. Anyway, so today's terrible story actually reaches into multiple states. You know, we're trying to find something terrible in every state in the United States. So the state that I'm choosing is actually where he did the crime that he got caught in. Does that make sense? <laughs> this is the state where the Will Rogers Airport and the Wiley Post Airport are both located, both named for famous people who died in an airplane crash. Actually, they died in the same airplane crash. Why, why are we naming airports after airplane crash victims? Just asking questions. It's also the birthplace of the bread twist tie, the shopping cart, and the first sale of a Girl Scout cookie. It's Oklahoma! And this is the story of George Machine Gun Kelly Barnes. Okay, yes, yeah, so I do put on makeup while I'm telling this terrible story, but I don't necessarily talk about it. So if you're interested to see what I'm using, look in the description box, everything's linked. Also, this guy, George Barnes, he was everywhere. Okay, he was in Tennessee, Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma. So it's really a mixed bag. And to be clear, it's not this machine gun, Kelly? My name's Colson. D different guy. On July 22nd, 1933, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Charles Urschel and his wife, Bernice, were playing bridge on their sun porch with their friends. Charles was a very wealthy oil executive who was well known in Oklahoma City. Well, all of a sudden, two men showed up with guns. Stick them up, see, or we'll blow your heads off. I've been watching a lot of old movies, okay? People talked like that. It was a thing. Urschel's wife screamed and one of the men yelled, stop that, keep quiet or we'll blow your heads off. Okay, I'm gonna stop. So these two guys with guns, now they've got the two couples. They take the two men away, they kidnap them. Um, they didn't even know which one was George Urschel, <laughs> so they took them both. So they blindfolded both of the men, stuffed them in the car, they're demanding to know which one is Urschel, they're not saying anything. Once they got away from the house, they did figure out, you know, who Urschel was, and then they dumped the other guy out on the side of the road unharmed. So who were these kidnappers and what did they want with Charles Urschel? We'll come back to that. George Kelly Barnes was born on July 18th, 1895 in Memphis. Tennessee to his mother Elizabeth Kelly Barnes and his father George Frederick Barnes Jr. Well George's birth date actually comes from the FBI files on the case and it matches his files from prison but his son's book actually has his birthday five years later so just wanted to add that little nugget. George Barnes eventually became the famous gangster Machine Gun Kelly but you wouldn't think that he was headed that way from his youth. So I know oftentimes in my videos, we see all kinds of red flags in a person's life where somebody could have or should have intervened. It could have redirected this person's life. George didn't have any of those. He actually grew up in a financially stable middle-class home. He had everything he wanted. He graduated from high school and he even started college at Mississippi State University and was gonna study agriculture. He just, he wasn't a great student, you know? He was getting like mostly C's. So while he's there studying, it's 1917 now, he meets a woman named Geneva Ramsey. They totally fell in love and they decided to leave school and get married. So now they're, you know, grown ups, adults living out on their own. They moved into a home. They welcomed two children into their family. And this was while George was driving a taxi to make money. And he even tried selling insurance like his father does, but it just really wasn't working out, you know? Eventually Geneva had enough and she left him and took the kids with her. Filed for divorce. Can you imagine? Barely the 20s. Divorce was not happening, but I guess it was. Now all alone, George started hanging out with some unsavory characters. You see, up to this point, you know, and actually after, people would tell you that George was very polite and personable. He 
detested violence, and he was not somebody that you would think of as a criminal. George got into bootlegging. This was during Prohibition, so if you don't know what Prohibition is, it's the period in history from 1920 to 1933 when it was illegal to make, purchase, transport, or consume any form of alcohol in the United States. Can you imagine? So bootlegging is the illegal production, distribution, and consumption of alcohol during that time. Fun fact, it was actually called bootlegging because they would hide the bottles of alcohol in the legs of their tall boots. Wow. While George was bootlegging, he was arrested several times for trafficking alcohol, and the first few times his father bailed him out, and you know, he would just not face any consequences. But George started to kind of feel bad for this disgrace that he was bringing upon his family who was otherwise very upstanding. He decided to change his name from George Barnes to George Kelly. In the late 1920s, George decided to go west and he moved to New Mexico. He was still bootlegging, you know, and he quickly got himself into some serious trouble. George smuggled alcohol onto indigenous tribal land and that was a federal crime. He actually got busted big time for that and he ended up spending three years in prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. Well, while he was in prison, he made some new friends and these were bank robbers, bootleggers, gangsters, and mobsters. Is that the same thing, gangsters and mobsters? Well, George was so well behaved while he was in prison, he was a model prisoner. You know, he was released very quickly, early, I mean, and he moved to Oklahoma City in 1929. He quickly established himself as a tough guy, you know, and he was bootlegging for a man named Steve Anderson. Well, Mr. Steve Anderson was seeing a very saucy young lady named Catherine Thorne, and pretty soon, George and Catherine were a secret thing. Catherine was living in and probably working for a brothel when George met her. She had also been married and divorced like two or three times before, and her second husband had been shot and killed under suspicious circumstances. The death was ruled a suicide, but the police and her family even were squinting. Catherine's upbringing was, you know, totally opposite of George's. She grew up in a family of criminals. <laughs> She was very devious and she knew how to get what she wanted, which was more. More money, more clothes, more jewelry, more, just more. George and Catherine started a relationship. And, you know, of course this was behind Steve's back. George's boss, Catherine's boyfriend, scandalous. They decided to run away together. They actually took Steve's Cadillac and his dog. His dog? Come on. Okay, so as I mentioned, Catherine was ambitious or greedy, either way. The bootlegging money just wasn't enough for her. So she suggested that George start robbing banks. She even came home one day with a lovely gift. Well, I did buy an accordion. You did? A 45 caliber Thompson machine gun. She gave George the nickname Machine Gun Kelly. Pretty catchy. So she encouraged George to practice, you know, become an expert with this machine gun. She's marketing, you know what I mean? She's marketing, she's trying to hype him up. I'm Machine Gun Kelly and I'm super late. Take one. He's got a nickname now, he's got this crazy weapon. So she was making the rounds in these underground drinking clubs, just talking him up to the other gangster types, you know, that he was really great with this machine gun. He could even write his name with it. You know, like, <laughs> she would even hand out these spent bullet casings, souvenirs from her husband, Machine Gun Kelly. Oh yeah, they had gotten married by this point. Did I, did I leave that out? Well, the people that knew George would say that he was a kind man who would never hurt anyone. Should we take a poop scoop break? and Catherine was painting a completely different picture. You know, a man to be feared. I'm an asshole, oh bitch ass God, motherfucker. Ronnie. Well, on November 30th, 1932, George and his friends, Albert Bates and Eddie Doyle, 
robbed the Tupelo Savings Bank in Tupelo, Mississippi for $32,000. Well, that's almost like $700,000 in today money. That's a lot. Even so, that payday wasn't enough to support them after it was divided and laundered. Also, at this time, bank robbers were like a serious problem. The Texas Bankers Association had started offering $5,000 rewards for every dead body proven to be a bank robber. It was called the Dead Bank Robbers Reward Fund. <laughs> real creative. $5,000 in 1932 is like $100,000 today. So people were hunting bank robbers for the reward money. It was like a job. Okay, so bank robbing is like too dangerous now. So Catherine talks George into shifting gears and going into kidnapping. So the first person that they targeted was Howard Wolverton. Mr. Wolverton lived in Oklahoma City and seemed like a very wealthy man. They asked for a ransom of $50,000. Howard told them, I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> Apparently, Howard had been living beyond his means, you know, trumping it. <laughs> Making it look like it he was wealthy when he was not. Oh God, I'm present, honey. So basically, they made him promise to pay. You know, he even signed a promissory note and they took him home. I mean, of, of course he disappeared to avoid having to pay and they never saw him again, which that's not really how kidnapping works, right? Don't you normally kidnap somebody and then ask someone else to pay the ransom? Okay, no wonder it didn't work out. So Catherine found a new target, Charles Urschel. Urschel was a pioneer in the American oil business and he had amassed a pretty substantial fortune and ha had a palatial mansion in Oklahoma City. So this time, the ransom that they were gonna ask for was $200,000. So in today money, that's like $4 million. Now we're caught up to the beginning of the story. Machine Gun Kelly and his friends had kidnapped Urschel and drove to Paradise, Texas to a farm that we now know was owned by Catherine's parents. George thought that crossing the state line would slow the cops down or even stop the investigation. But us crew crime creeps know that crossing state lines with a kidnapping victim turns it into a federal crime and the FBI takes over. I didn't realize that the FBI was a thing that long ago, but they were actually founded in 1908. The more you know. I gotta put on my eyebrows and it's not happening on camera today. Cause, okay eyebrows on. So, where were we? Oh yeah, interstate kidnapping. The reason that interstate kidnapping is a federal crime is because of the Lindbergh Law. You might remember that case. So, Charles Lindbergh's baby was kidnapped and murdered even after a ransom was paid. So, that law went into effect in 1932, so it's quite possible that Charles just didn't know about it. But anyways, so they have a blindfolded Charles Urschel in the car. But Charles Urschel was not a dum-dum. You know, he didn't get rich by just like happenstance. So, he's, yes, blindfolded, but he was paying attention. You know, he was memorizing the road as they traveled. Was it gravel? Was it paved? Was it raining outside? Did they turn? Did he hear any water? You know, everything. He was remembering. Back to the Lindbergh baby. So when that baby was kidnapped right out of its crib and eventually killed, it looked very bad for the FBI. And especially it was bad for the director at the time, J. Edgar Hoover. So after that, it was his mission to have a better outcome on the next one. And they expected to have a next one because kidnapping was the hot new thing. I mean, there was even a national kidnapping hotline established, and this was in the 1930s, you guys. Phones looked like this. <laughs> Urschel is kidnapped, blindfolded, but paying attention. But back at his mansion, Bernice, called the hotline and it was quickly transferred to J. Edgar Hoover himself. I mean, this was an oil executive that was kidnapped, so that tracks. The Oklahoma City special agent in charge, Ralph Colvin, quickly arrived at the Urschel mansion to handle the scene. The next morning, a friend of the Urschel's fellow oil executive, John Catlett, came forward because he had received an envelope with a ransom note inside. This note had like 
very odd, complicated instructions in it. It included, you know, some kind of coded ad that they were meant to run in the local newspaper, and this was how they were gonna signal to each other that they had received the messages and were following instructions. So old timey. <laughs> okay, so another classified ad was published by the kidnappers. You know, this is how they're communicating. Email's not a thing. And they arranged a handoff of the ransom in Kansas City. So what this entailed was John Catlett and then another oil bro named E.E. E. Kirkpatrick. A side note, it seemed very common for people to just go by letters back in the day and not like common letters like BJ. E.E. E. Just saying. Okay, well, EE e. was meant to carry the bag of $200,000 cash to a hotel in Kansas City. And then later in the instructions, it ended up with him just kind of standing in the street waiting for some kind of signal for a handoff. They're standing there and some shifty dude in a linen suit and a Panama hat <laughs> in Kansas approached Kirkpatrick and said, I'll take that grip. This old timey language is d truly the best. It's a gift. Watch some old movies, I'm not kidding. Say you cover a lot of ground yourself. You better beat it, I hear they're gonna tear you down and put up an office building where you're standing. Poetry. Kirkpatrick must have thought he was in a gangster movie and he tried to argue with the guy, but the guy was like, nah dude. <laughs> Well, he took the money and he did say that Urschel would be released home safe within 12 hours. He wasn't released in 12 hours, but he was released. Can you believe that? It seemed like Urschel was just like not phased at all by this little adventure that he was on. So it was actually nine days later, or he had been kidnapped for a total of nine days. So on July 31st, he was returned and he had quite a story to tell the FBI. So Mr. Clever George Urschel, was his name George? No, Charles. <laughs> Mr. Clever Charles Urschel was incredibly smart and extremely aware. <laughs> What's the word for that? <laughs> Observant. That's the word. <laughs> So he was very smart and very observant. He had been paying attention and keeping mental notes of the conditions of their travel. He had been taken to what seemed like a farmhouse because he would hear the sounds of like chickens and other animals. He recalled that they drank well water out of tin cups and he was blindfolded, remember? Blindfolded. He also recalled hearing the sounds of airplanes flying overhead twice a day. These are all very useful tips. And you know what? We have learned in previous videos that if you ever get kidnapped, Pay attention as much as you can. He also made sure to get his fingerprints everywhere that he possibly could. Well, all of these details were relayed to the FBI and they, the FBI, <laughs> they reviewed all of the airplane schedules within a 600 mile radius of Oklahoma City. Now, this was the early 1930s, of course, so it didn't take long for them to narrow it down, a flight path that they could search. So they started doing flyovers in the area. And wouldn't you know, they found a farm that exactly matched the information gave by Charles, given by Charles Urschel. And it was owned by Boss Shannon, Catherine Kelly's stepfather, George Kelly's father-in-law. So the FBI knew for sure that George Machine Gun Kelly was behind this kidnapping. Remember, before all of this, Catherine had been going around telling everybody who would listen that her husband was this badass gangster and you know who else heard the rumors? The FBI and the police. The raid was led by Gus Jones of the FBI and they even included Charles Urschel, <laughs> who was carrying a sawed off shotgun, saying that if there was a shootout, he wanted to be in on it. Yo, know, the 30s was wild. <laughs> I guess when you're rich, you can do that kind of stuff. Anyways, the raid was pretty tame. The only people they found inside was Boss Shannon and his wife, Aura, Catherine's mother and stepfather. It seems um, old MGK and Catherine weren't there at the time. You know, the Shannons were questioned and they readily admitted that Urschel had been there, held at the farm, having been kidnapped by George Kelly and his associate, Albert Bates. So Machine Gun Kelly and Catherine were officially on the run and they lasted several weeks. At some point they decided to separate and George went to Mississippi, Catherine went to Texas, but they eventually reunited in Memphis to stay with longtime friend, John 
John Titchener. Meanwhile, the Urschel ransom money that had been paid started showing up in banks in the areas of interest. You know, the feds were tracking the serial numbers on the bills, you see. They started to find a bunch of like sketchy cashier's checks that had been issued. There was also a lot of weird deposits being made under the names of known Kelly associates. And these were all people that were very likely paid to like launder the money. Basically what it meant was that the circle of friends, the associates just got too big and loose lips sink ships. So with that many people involved in this kind of scheme, cover up, money laundering, whatever, somebody was gonna start talking and they did. So after receiving an anonymous tip, anonymous, <laughs> on the morning of September 26th, 1933, police surrounded the home of John Titchener. This was in Memphis, Tennessee. It was so early in the morning that apparently Machine Gun Kelly was still in his jam jams. He, he also was uh, super hungover from the night before. Gangsters, they're just like us. Catherine um, was still asleep in bed. So George immediately surrendered and he either said, I've been waiting for you guys, or don't shoot G-men, don't shoot G-men. Side note, G-men was the common term for federal agents at the time. Also, my old neighbors used to have a dog named G-man. He died. Rest in peace, G-man. So like I said, George was very docile and cooperative and um, friendly during the arrest, but Catherine, not so much. She was like fighting, like literally kicking and screaming. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> Saying that they had done nothing wrong. What do you want with us? Well, both George and Catherine pled not guilty to the charges of kidnapping, false imprisonment, and additional crimes. But after standing trial, each of them were sentenced to life in federal prison. Life for kidnapping. Nobody died. Correct me if I'm wrong. Put it in the comments below. I don't think that there was any murders attributed to this. Robberies, yes. Kidnappings, yes. Bootlegging, yeah. I don't think there was any murders though. Tell me if I'm wrong. I'm open to it. Well, Catherine was sent to a women's prison in, I think, West Virginia. It's unclear to me if she started in Cincinnati or West Virginia or vice versa, either way. But uh, old MGK was sent to Leavenworth, Kansas. And he spent a lot of time bragging about his crimes and talking about how easy it would be for him to break out of prison. They believed him, I guess, and he was actually moved from Leavenworth to a new prison in early September, 1934, Alcatraz. George Barnes was actually one of the very first groups that moved to Alcatraz and his prisoner number was AZ117. So while on the rock, George went back to being a model prisoner. It seems that, you know, without Catherine's intense manipulation and influence, George just got to be George again. He was actually so well behaved that in 1951, he was transferred back to Leavenworth and on July 18th, 1958, on his 59th birthday, birthday, George Kelly Barnes suffered a heart attack and died in prison. I think I want a little mole today. What do we think? Which side? This side? Yeah, I've got a little zit right here that I think could be a nice mole. What do we think? Okay, so this isn't about Catherine Kelly, but if you're interested, she was sentenced to life in prison. She actually was sent to prison with her mother, a convicted accomplice. Hang on, I really don't like this. I'm so ADD. It's getting so bad in my old age. I'm just not used to seeing it there, so I'm like, Catherine and her mother were sent to prison. Her father also was sentenced to 11 years in prison, which he did complete. So after serving 25 years and filing multiple appeals, Catherine Kelly and her mother were released in 1958 based on a ruling regarding prosecutorial misconduct. So after Catherine was released, she changed her name to Lara Cleo Kelly and she later died in 1985 at 81 years old. Now, you know me, I like to condense the stories and kind of keep things simple. And this one is anything but. This one is so convoluted and it involves so many different people that you could really make a series of it. <laughs> and thankfully, there are many to choose from and I'll link a few down below in the description box if you wanna know all the dirty details. But for now, that is the story of George Machine Gun Kelly Barnes. <laughs> 
Again, if you want to know any of the makeup that I used on my face today, just look down in the description box. Everything is linked. Also linked are some fun coupon codes if you're interested. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on the other socials as well. I'm still kind of settling into my routine here. So it's been a little spotty. It's been a little tough, but I'm getting better, but it's it's not because anything's slowing down for me. Things are crazy here. <laughs> if you're interested to recommend a crew crime story, I would love to hear from you. Look down in the description box. There's a link to a Google document that you can complete to send me all of the details. And that is it for now. I will catch you next week in the next video. Bye. So Chor George, his name was George. Back to the Herschel, Herschel. So she an expert with the machine gun. Expert with the expert with mach Why can't I say this? We're just going for all brown today. Ooh, this is not working out. <laughs> that looks terrible. Post airport alert. I don't know, but my teeth look really white. Hey.